Good morning, everyone. Good morning to Stanford Medicine Live. Our theme today is, what is the state of Stanford Medicine? Our event, our event is to provide updates on where we are now and also where we're going in the future. Something new and different today, get, uh, get in front of your laptops, desktops, or phones. We're gonna be doing some poll everywhere questions to take the temperature of our Stanford Medicine community. Today, we're fortunate enough to be joined by our Stanford Medicine leadership, Lloyd Miner, David Entwistle, and Paul King. So we'll start off, go right to our first question. Lloyd, the entire community has faced personal and professional challenges this year. When you reflect on the past six months, uh, what comes to the top of your mind? Well, thank you, Andre. It's good to be back here with you and with Paul and with David today. I think back to early in the morning of Friday, March the 6th, when I got a call from Dr. Norm Risk, our chief medical officer at Stanford HealthCare, uh, saying that we had a faculty member who had tested positive for COVID-19 and that that faculty member was having respiratory difficulties and was going to be admitted to Stanford Hospital. We had begun to do COVID testing here clinically just a few days earlier because we were among the first, in fact, probably the first in the United States to receive FDA EUA emergency use authorization for our test. And I'd been following that and tracking that as we were going through the approval process. But that call indicating that one of our faculty members was sick and was gonna need hospitalization really brought it home. Uh, brought it home as to how serious this disease is. Now, fortunately, that faculty member and other healthcare workers who have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus have recovered. But it was a, a very tangible indication that we're dealing with a serious communicable disease, highly communicable disease, um, and that um, we had to do everything we can to respond to the disease, to protect our workforce. And then, of course, we rapidly shut down our region, our state. Uh, we shut down elective surgeries. At one point in the latter part of March, early April, over 60% of the beds at Stanford Hospital were vacant because we prepared for a surge in patients as it was appropriate for us to do, but because of the careful public health measures that were taken in March and April in our region, we didn't have a surge then. And then on April 22nd, we got the go-ahead from Governor Newsom to resume elective surgeries. And we rapidly scaled back up because we'd been deferring on care, deferring on care that was much needed, but that we were told that we couldn't do because of preparing for the surge and wanting to limit mobility um, in case there was a surge. And we rapidly brought patients in to be able to provide the care that they needed, having some operative days that were among, if not the busiest we've ever had in our healthcare delivery system. And then, just as we were getting things back together, I think, uh, in terms of the care we're delivering, the routines that we were able to resume, and then on May 25th, the horrible, horrific murder of George Floyd. That in and of itself, and I still shiver when I reflect back on seeing the video of his murder. That in of itself is horrible, but knowing that it represents a pattern of violence against black Americans is even more horrible. And the three of us, Paul, David, and I, came together with you to firmly state that black lives matter and that we will do everything we can in our roles and also everything we can as an institution to make sure that black lives matter and that we do everything we can to make this a better society. And there are a number of actions we've taken since then, and I think we'll talk about those more during the course of, of today's State of Stanford Medicine Town Hall. Now we find ourselves with increasing cases. We, we open things back up. As Governor Newsom has said, reopening is not like an on-off switch. It's more like a dimmer switch. We reopen in our state, in our region. We've had an increase in cases, and so we've had to scale things back. And one of the things that you're going to hear David and Paul and I repeat multiple times during uh, our session with you here today is wear your mask, observe social distancing, wash your hands. These public health measures are essential 
in order for us not to have a massive surge in patients, in order for us not to overwhelm the healthcare delivery system, which has been so devastating in other areas. David. Lloyd, thank you. It's great to be here with you. As I think about what's top of mind, there's so many things that come to mind that I want to share just a couple things. One is, and I, you know, there's a danger always calling out special attention to anyone because there's so many special things that we do. But I want to share with you two weekends ago, we had one of the largest surges that weekend in the number of COVID patients that actually were in-house. In fact, we were almost double the height of what we had seen before in the March-April timeframe. And on that same weekend, I want to call out our cardiovascular team. If you look at our CV resources, our CT anesthesia resources, our CT surgery resources, on that weekend, in fact, we did six heart transplants. Who does six heart transplants in a weekend? I have never been in an organization that does that. When we were in the height of what we were treating with COVID, and in fact, we had incredible outcomes for all of those patients. Well, I can tell you who does that, Stanford Medicine. We have such an incredible team of resources here that it just continues as I think about what is top of mind, our ability to be able to provide for our community what we need is part of the cadence of who we are. It's part of what we do. The fact that we were able to respond to this incident and one that we're still in, but one that allowed us to be able to be a resource for our community is quite amazing. And so as I think about what's top of mind, how will we respond over time to what some of the ramifications are of these events? We certainly know that as we look at the work that we do, it's gonna be different. We know that our digital health services is a major part of what we do now, and in fact allows us to be able to stay safe, keep distance in many cases, when we have individuals that do have the virus. We know that also as we think about our own internal resources and the way that we responded to this. I was just a couple days ago down in the parking lot where we were, had a wonderful resource of the emergency department actually treating patients and continuing to do that in a distant environment. As we think about the fact that we, many of us, in fact, some of you today are probably at home, distance, as we think about what we do long-term, it will change the way that we think about our work. And we do know that there will be changes in the way that we get paid, because in fact, as we think about some of the changes in the payer mix that we have, we have to continue to look for efficiencies in where we're at. I'll reiterate though, and I wanna make sure that you know, we continue to be on a strong financial footing, and we appreciate all of the tremendous work that people have done to help us get there, and there are not any further anticipated changes as part of that because of the great work that we've done. But we want to continue to say thank you, and that's top of mind for me, is how much we appreciate the great work and innovativeness that's gone into this. Thanks for all the work that has gone into that. Paul, let me turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, welcome back, everyone. It's been a while since David Lloyd and I have been able to be together uh, with you on this Thursday afternoon. I guess it's still morning officially. Uh, what's top of mind for me is what's been on top of mind for top of my mind for the last five months is how do we remain true to our mission and our values as we make sure that we're here for those who need us most. Uh, as I think back over the past five months, Lloyd and David have done a great job of recapping the journey that we've all taken together. Uh, but what's important to us today is what's been important to us since those days in early March, which is how do we keep you safe uh, so that you're safe enough to take care of others. And how do we do that in a way that makes sense? As we looked at our financial devastation that uh, was taken as a result of some of the governmental orders to stand down, uh, we were able to address that crisis in a way that maintained your employment, maintained your benefits, maintained your salaries. That was very important to us because we felt that that was consistent with our values. Now as we enter this uh, sort of mid phase of the crisis, we know that we're not at the end of this thing. Uh, this is gonna be with us for a while. Uh, we know that you're tired, you're fatigued, you're scared. As we see the numbers in the community rise and we see our inpatient census uh, reach levels that we haven't seen since the beginning of this crisis, uh, we have to begin to think actively, how do we help you get through this as, you can, as you're concerned about what's happening at home with your own family members? So that's what's top of mind for me this morning and glad to be back with you today. 
Andre. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that the notion of this continuum of work and then home and then home and then school is being completely sort of redefined as we do this. I think as we started, we thought that this was gonna be an episode, we were gonna get through the episode and everything was gonna be normal on the other side of the episode. And I think we're now all realizing like how do we you know, bleed into this in a way that we understand is sustainable. And I, and I worry about all our uh, Stanford Medicine um, employees and all that team who uh, have to deal with those issues right now. Lloyd, in, in June, we had a special town hall about racial justice. What steps have we taken as an institution since that time? Well, one of the things that we've done, as I mentioned before, is that Paul, David, and I have firmly stated that we want to make a difference. We want to make a difference starting here in our environment, working with you, working towards justice and equity. And we want to address the racial and the racial injustices, the injustices in our society related to sex, related to gender orientation, related to disability, the many, many disparities and injustices that still are in the fabric of the American society. In order to do that and to get advice on what we're doing and in order to reach out systematically to you to hear your thoughts and your suggestions and your experiences, we're forming a commission, a commission on justice and equity to advise us on what we're doing today and to help us think in the future about how we can be more impactful both within Stanford Medicine, Stanford University, but also in our broader society. It doesn't stop there though. Working with our department chairs, we're firmly restating our commitment to having a more diverse faculty. We've made a great deal of progress in the diversity of our students, both our MD students, our PhD students. And we've made some progress in the diversity of our house staff and of our postdoctoral fellows. But in particular, we need much more emphasis on diversity and inclusion in our faculty. At the university level, Provost Drell announced a cluster hire initiative that we will be participating in as well to identify, and the cluster hires are focused on the topic of race in America and racial justice in America. As well as, we wanna make sure that as we have been doing, that diversity is represented in every faculty search that's done in the Stanford School of Medicine. Working closely with Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, she and her staff help search committees to be able to plan and to be intentional about reaching out to get a diverse candidate pool and then about recruiting candidates here who come from diverse backgrounds. We know we have more work to do on this, and I'm happy that we're all partnering together in order to have an impact. And we for sure want and need your input as we move forward. Thank you. David, cases of COVID-19 are surging in the Bay Area and across the country. What do you see as the primary reason for this? And what can Stanford Medicine specifically do to reduce infections, not only locally, but nationally? <laughs> This is a great question. I'll have to channel my ep inner epidemiology uh, it, that uh, we actually have some perspective. But let me say first off, and I, I, I know we are being very thoughtful. I know that we're trying our best, but let me just say, we've got to wear our mask. We have got to socially distance. We have got to use good hygiene, especially as we think about our hand hygiene. And we're just not seeing that. So if you look at the challenges that we're having now, and in fact, we are seeing a surge in cases, the positive pieces. And what's worrisome about that too, is that we're starting to see it in some of our younger population. It used to be at Packard when this all began, every week we would report zero, zero, zero in terms of the patients. We're now having teenagers that are showing up in the children's hospital. So we've got to be more diligent and more vigilant at how we do that. So you're going to hear this from poor, Paul Lloyd and I throughout the session about how can we be better stewards uh, in terms of how we are being good examples in our own families and in, in what we're doing, uh, not only at home, but also at work. Great, thank you. Paul, so volume at the children's hospital typically has this cadence where it goes down when school starts again and then pops back up potentially in the summer. Um, do you anticipate that this year will be any different? Uh, thanks, Andra. 
Uh, you're right. Usually summer is our busy time. That's when kids are out of school and that's when we get a lot of the elective procedures done. Of course, the pandemic threw a wrench into our normal cycle. Uh, but what we've seen in terms of the recovery that we reported to you probably at our last session, uh, we saw that recovery come back in terms of our volumes. Our volumes are back, quite frankly, to where they were pre-COVID. Uh, we see strong demand for our services because, as Lloyd mentioned, we were asked to discontinue some of the non-urgent cases back in March. Uh, some of that backlog is still working its way through the system, uh, so we still see those strong numbers. And because school is not back in yet in terms of in-person learning, uh, we still see those strong numbers. Uh, so this year will be different. We are not quite sure when we're going to see that dip, uh, but when kids do go back to school, of course, they're not going to be available for some of the elective procedures, uh, but so far we're still seeing strong demand. Okay, great, thank you. And now we'll turn to all our poll everywhere questions. You should be seeing instructions on your screen. Uh, in any web browser, go to pollev.com forward slash Stanford Med. It is not case sensitive. And at that point, you should be seeing the first question and you're welcome to start voting at that point. So pollev.com forward slash Stanford Med. And uh, we'll go with the first question here shortly. On a scale of one to five, how would you rate your team's resourcefulness and innovation over the past six months? Five being extremely resourceful and innovative. So at this point, we'll have our audience vote and we'll see answers here in a few minutes. I wonder what it would happen if you put in 10. <laughs> like, what would, so. That's, how that's my answer. I think we are here. Yeah, so. I know, that's, that's my answer, so. <laughs> Excellent, okay, very good. Um, so how would you rate your team's resourcefulness and innovation in the past six months? Uh, five being most resourceful. Um, be helpful to have a little bit of access on here, but I'm going to assume that our five is uh, the 40, um, greater than 40% on the left-hand side. So. Uh, a nice curve there. So I'm gonna pose the same question uh, to our Stanford Medicine leadership on us, you know, what, what do you feel Stanford Medicine has done in a particularly innovative and, uh, and, and, and in an innovative way? Well, there have been so many things. Uh, let me just highlight one, and that is it, it began with the test. I mean, how were we able to identify that faculty member uh, on March the 6th is because we had an, a clinically approved test uh, that, as David indicated, we were the only uh, institution in the Bay Area for many weeks that, that had an, a viable test. At one point, we were doing a third of all the tests in, in California. And we continue to test a lot of people and, and we're looking at scaling up even more. But that was innovation. That was a faculty member, Dr. Ben Pinsky, who Early on in January, when the sequence of the virus was published, knew that he could develop an RT-PCR for the virus. He did it in his lab, then transferred it to the clinical lab and got approval from the FDA. Likewise, early stage clinical trials. We've, we have a number of trials going on with repurposed antivirals. We're also going to be a site for uh, monoclonal antibody therapies. And we also have been approved to be a site for two of the vaccine trials with more information coming about those in the near future and enrollment expected to begin in the September or October timeframe. Innovation is in our spirit and it's been so well demonstrated during this pandemic. And everything we do here arises from our people. And the most important responsibility we have here is to our people, making sure that we can deliver the healthcare that we know how to deliver, making sure that we bring the innovative solutions first here and then to the world. And I couldn't be more proud, and I, I know David, Paul, and I talk about this all the time, how proud we are of our people that under these incredibly stressful circumstances, everyone has continued to perform so remarkably well. I know my colleagues will have a lot more examples of innovation, but I just wanted to highlight what we've done in testing, therapeutics, and ultimately participating in a vaccine trial and analyzing the responses to vaccines. David? Yeah. One thought that I had, and immediately, this actually began actually several years ago, as we were actually doing our integrated strategic plan with the thoughtfulness that came out of that and the foreplanning that actually identified that digital health was an important aspect of what we do. 
In fact, I think one of the things that was incredibly innovative is actually was part of what we were doing before, but we weren't doing a lot of it. In fact, if you look at our clinic visits, we were doing about 2% of our visits in that. Telehealth. Telehealth is one of the extraordinary things that in fact has been part of our system, but we have showed incredible innovation. To think that we got to 72% roughly of all of our visits, and now we're roughly at about 40% of our visits still being in digital health. That's an incredible innovation that we have actually applied internally to be able to provide care and better treatment. And if you look at whether it's Dr. Rusty Hoffman or Dr. Topher Shah or Chris O'Dell or our whole team there that had the great foresight and planning to have that ready, but it really is down to our faculty and providers that have been able to do that. And I just appreciate all the great work that's gone into that and allowed us to continue the great work that we're doing even in a digital format. Great. Paul. Paul. Uh, thank you, David and Lloyd. I, I think the thing that's impressed me most about innovation here at Stanford is, as Lloyd said, it's in our DNA. So the ability to innovate has been the most innovative thing that I've seen, if that didn't sound too repetitive. Uh, but when they're in the absence of a test, we developed one. In the absence of drive-through testing, we developed that. Uh, when we looked at how do we real-time pivot, how do we have rapid cycle improvements real-time on the moment, when we were faced with financial devastation, we were able to come up with strategies that met that crisis at a time that we also took care of our people. Uh, when we look at the collaboration across all of Stanford Medicine, those sort of alignments and partnerships that were in place before the crisis certainly helped us get through the rest of uh, the toughest part of it. So I think the innovation that you've heard from our colleagues uh, and the innovation in and of itself are impressive and it makes us proud to be here at Stanford. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So we are living through a unique and transformative period. What past experiences have you drawn upon as you have led Stanford Medicine through this crisis? Well, I derive a lot of strength from uh, the people I work with. Um, and I said before that uh, we have an amazing group of people here. And I derive ideas, we all derive ideas and and hone those ideas from our interactions with, with each other, from our interactions with the broader community. Now we've been deprived of the ability to do that directly because of the pandemic, but we've adapted. We've all learned how to use Zoom and use it a lot. And that interaction, that interaction has to go on. That support for each other has to go on. And as we navigate the future, uh, the financial future, the future in terms of when we can bring, for example, students back into our environment, how we bring them back in the medical school and other parts of the university. As we navigate that, we need to have, continue to have this free and open exchange of ideas. And you mentioned something before, Andre, that I think is very, very important. That is, I think all of us were thinking in March and April when we didn't see the surge and when there was there were times when we were doing a lot of testing, and fortunately we were not seeing many positive cases. I know I was thinking, well, ah, maybe we're at the end of this. And then as we opened back up, we saw that we're not even at the end of the beginning, probably. And that, that's been a hard realization. That realization plus the fact that we've dealt with some devastating financial consequences of, of the pandemic already. David and Paul mentioned the actions taken on the hospital side and the fact that on the healthcare delivery system side and the fact that we are anticipating based on current levels of activity that the financial ship has been righted. On the School of Medicine side, it's been much more challenging. And we had a town hall, our most recent town hall that we had with you, where we discussed the very painful decision of having to do a limited number of layoffs, 32 permanent layoffs, two furloughs in the School of Medicine among the hardest decisions that we as in leadership have had to make. But supporting each other through this, making decisions collectively with the input and the wisdom that comes from this community is gonna be really important as we move forward. Great, David. You know, as I think about that question, that's, uh, it's interesting what experience have we've drawn on to get us through. I mean, how many of us would have ever believed we would live through a pandemic? What do we draw on to gain our own support 
As I think about that, when I was in high school, and I was probably one of the ones in the back of the pack, so I, I say that you know with full insight, but I ran cross country, and we had an incredible team. But when it came time for meets, cross country is about individual effort. You each have to run and get across the line, but collectively it's the five of you that score the highest, or in fact the lowest that come in, that actually go to whether the team is successful or not. And as I think about and draw upon some of the experiences, that team is so incredibly important. And I can tell you, we as teammates were cheering each other across the line because we knew that our collective effort together is what caused us to be able to be successful. And as I think about what experience I've drawn on, it is that team that's here. It's that incredible collection of individual resources that do amazing things. So whether we think about the care that we give, the testing that we were able to provide, the innovativeness in the way that we provided the care and testing, all of that collectively is what has allowed us to be able to weather the storm to this point. We know there's a lot ahead of us, but it's gonna be that collective team that actually allows us to be able to continue to be successful. Great, Paul. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, for me, what I draw upon is, is uh, I'm a Nebraskan. That's my, my native land, so I was born and raised there. And in the Midwest, we have sort of a native optimism in terms of there's always a better way uh, to get through bad times. And we never doubt that we're going to see the better end of that. Uh, it's just a question of how we're going to get through that. So I think that first and foremost is what I draw upon. The other is we've seen, like David and Lloyd, uh, hopefully this is the only pandemic we'll see in our careers. Uh, but we have seen other challenges. When we think about the country's response to 9-11, uh, for those of you old enough to remember Y2K and how that was gonna be the end of the world as we knew it. And as we think through hurricanes and floods and fires, uh, too numerous to count, particularly here in California, uh, I think about how in each instance, healthcare is called upon to be part of the solution. Uh, here in healthcare, we do crisis like nobody's business. And we, we thrive at that, we are excellent at that. And this pandemic is no different. Uh, so I draw upon that history of healthcare being a leader in the solutions, and we're certainly seeing that here at Stanford. Yes, I'll have to say I've been drawing upon uh, my core training in emergency medicine, which is you see a patient in crisis, and it's certainly their crisis if it's not anyone else's crisis, and you gather information, a limited amount of information, and in a limited time period have to make significant decisions about whether or not to go to the hospital or go home or what treatments are needed. And it sort of seems like that now, where every day we gather some facts, we think about what happened, we think towards the future, and make the very best decisions we can for our team members as we move forward. Um, but there's always this still level of uncertainty, but that's okay. I feel as though we're doing excellently and very well at being able to take the information we have and move forward in a positive way. Um, another get to know you question. Lloyd, what are you doing to maintain personal wellness amidst intense work hours and endless Zoom meetings? That's a great question. Um, you know, life is very different now than it was uh, before COVID-19. I, I mean, that in a sense is a trite statement. Of course it is. But um, I haven't been on an airplane since February and I can say I haven't missed it one bit. Uh, and um, uh, you know, I have dinner at home every evening although I enjoy, very much enjoy, uh, the social interactions that prior to COVID were and will be in the future an important part of, of this job, my job. Um, I've enjoyed having, you know, a regular routine that is hard to, to achieve, uh, was hard to achieve before COVID or, or more stable routine. Uh, I'm still an avid hiker. Um, you know, I'm a cellist and I'm actually practicing again. So um, that's been a lot of fun. And in the Zoom era, I tracked down my former cello teacher uh, from the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, who's now in New York, and uh, we're having Zoom cello lessons. It works, uh, who would have thought? But it actually works really, really well. And he's had a lot of experience doing it, needless to say. So um, that, and, and Paul said, uh, Paul always has many important things to say and many wise things to say. But in particular, Paul, your comment about being a Nebraskan and optimism um, I, I find that really important too. It, it's, you know, there, there are lots of things to be discouraged about today, uh, but there's also a lot of promise and opportunity in the future. 
And I remind myself of that every day. And, and I think it's important that we remind each other of that every day. Great. David. You know, I have to say, one of the things that I draw a great source of wellness and comfort from is just time with my family. And um, I have had a great opportunity to spend some time, not only more time with my wife, but also spending time communicating with my parents uh, and seeing the uh, more opportunity to get better acquainted there. I have to say, sometimes you get caught up in your day-to-day -day in your job and you don't get to spend as much time to do that. And I think that's been one of the things that's been uh, brought great joy. I'll also say, I'm not as good as Lloyd because I'm not a cellist. And so what I've been really excited about is actually that I've been able to lower my biking time going up Kings Mountain by two minutes. And so I look at some of my personal wellness, be able to do one of the things that I enjoy in cycling. And uh, that was certainly a milestone for me. But I think you've got to find those things that you enjoy. And in fact, I hope with not being able to go do things my wife and I enjoy with going to movies and other things and getting out, uh, now we have more time to focus on some of those things that keep us a little closer to home. Great, Paul. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I'm not the avid cyclist that David is. I, I did purchase a, a stationary bike after the first of the year. Uh, that bike was getting a little lonely in the corner. And as I think about uh, getting back on that bike, actually I'm more than thinking, David, I'm actually on the bike. Uh, but uh, shaving two minutes off, uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing now is uh, before I was part of the economy that kept restaurants in business. And uh, so now I do more home chef cooking. Uh, they make it appear as if you almost know what you're doing. It's already prepackaged, and but you get to chop things up. So that makes you feel better. Uh, so cooking better, eating healthier on the Peloton and keeping my Zoom shirt on the chair at, at home so I can jump on a call at any moment. Excellent. Yeah. Those are all great. All right, for our next Poll Everywhere question. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, go to any web browser and type in uh, pollev.com forward slash Stanford Med. And once you're registered, you'll be seeing what the next question is. So just going to your web browser, pollev.com forward slash Stanford Medicine. All right. Agree or disagree, COVID-19 has exposed flaws in our nation's healthcare system. I'll say that one more time. Agree or disagree, COVID-19 has, uh, has exposed flaws in our nation's healthcare system. Yeah, I, 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 this is not what I expected, David, did you think? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> It's all good. So clearly, uh, for those of you who might be on the phone and not seeing this, 93% uh, have said that they felt as though COVID-19 has exposed uh, flaws in our nation's health care system. Um, very good. All right. And so next, as an institution, we spent years developing an integrated strategic plan with a vision to lead in precision health. How should our vision account for the challenges we've seen this year in 2020? Well, one of the things I think following up on that poll is that, uh, you know, one of the things that's been exposed by COVID-19 is the disparities in health care and health outcomes in the United States. Every study looking at the demography of COVID-19 has pointed out these profound disparities black Americans between 3.5 and 4.5 times more likely to be infected and having a significantly poorer outcome. You know, when we talk about cases in a region, if you actually break it down by zip code, it's the zip codes that are in socioeconomically underprivileged areas that account for the bulk of the cases. I mean, this is, COVID-19 is at its heart and core an underscoring of the marked disparities in health and healthcare in the United States. And we have to do better than that. Uh, we have to, as a country, figure out, um, and, and it, it's such a complicated problem. Uh, it, the, the healthcare we provide at our institutions, I believe is fundamentally equitable, but what leads up to the illness itself is where the inequities come in. And certainly we have more work to do within our institutions as well. 
But I think our integrated strategic plan, first of all, enabled us to respond cohesively and aligned to what I think for all of us here today and, and watching, this is the greatest challenge we faced in our professional lifetimes. And for us to come together and respond in the way that we have really was enabled by the process of the integrated strategic plan and the workflows and the relationships that were built up as a result of that planning process. Great. You know, just building on that a bit, one of the things um, we have is, you know, one of the challenges I think that came out of that actually prepared us well for this uh, COVID-19 is the fact that we do work together as Stanford Medicine. You have the three organizations that have come together to plan. One of the things that we did early on was stand up what was our command center that was being led jointly by Stanford Children's and Stanford Healthcare and the School of Medicine so that we all came together to make sure that we're all working and pulling in the same direction. That foundation was built in many cases by what we did in our integrated strategic plan. If you look at the individual components of that, there's some incredible pieces that have come out of that. I've already talked a little bit about some of the digitally driven pieces, but that teed up very well, our ability to be able to respond. And I think part of our challenge would be so much momentum going in so many places as part of our strategic plan. How do we keep that momentum going and making sure that we continue the innovation that we've talked about, continue the drive toward how do we become a more value-driven organization? Part of the challenge, and we know that the financial aspects of what we had and have gone through have been the result that our business went down by an incredible amount on a short period of time, and the lost revenue is very challenging to an organization. But at the same time, we still have a lot of work to do as you think about the efficiencies that we can create internally, whether that's looking at variation of care, whether that's looking at some of the things that we do on our testing, all the aspects that go into the care environment, there's still opportunities for us to create more value. And part of that value is also how do we continue, that came out of the ISP, the experience that our patients have, and making sure that that's in the forefront of how do we create that value that our patients perceive when they come in. But there's so many things that we've got to be able to keep that momentum going and making sure that what we've started continues despite managing this pandemic around us. Great, Paul. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, sort of going back to the exercise analogy that we were talking about before in terms of riding bikes, uh, with our ISP, our Integrated Strategic Plan, uh, we had already sort of developed the muscle of collaboration and partnership. So when we think about what we were doing across the two hospitals in the School of Medicine, we already had a cadence and a pattern of working together so that when the pandemic hit us, this was not new for us to come together. As David just shared with you, when we set up our command center, uh, that was done collaboratively. Everything we've done since that point in time absolutely has been in line with that. I think most of you are familiar with the pillars of our ISP, Integrated Strategic Plan, being value-focused, digitally driven, and uniquely Stanford. Uh, when we look at uh, the examples we've given you today around innovation, uh, we've given you a number of examples of innovation. When we talk about value, the value that we bring not only to our broader community, uh, but to those who rely on us for care. And then uniquely Stanford part of that. I'm not sure that any other academic medical center could lay claim to what we've been able to accomplish, uh, not only over our history, but certainly within the last three to four months. Lloyd, why doesn't the U.S. have a handle on COVID-19 when it seems like other countries do? Uh, New Zealand made it uh, 100 days without having an individual with community spread. What can we do at Stanford Medicine to help? Well, I'm not a political scientist, but, but one of the bedrock foundations of, of American governance is the principle of federalism, and that is that a lot of power and decision making is entrusted to states and, and local regions. Well, you know, this virus doesn't know the boundary between one county and the next, between one state and the next, or even one country and the next. Also, we in the United States, since we eradicated many of the most devastating infectious diseases 50 years ago, or at least we have developed vaccines that when appropriately used, eradicate those diseases, we, we diverted our attention away from public health and we let the public health infrastructure within the country decay. 
And that was painfully obvious in the early days of COVID-19 when we had no testing and some of the testing kits that were being sent out by, by the government, not here, but by the government, were proven to be uh, inaccurate. We've got to rebuild our public health infrastructure in, in the country. We've got to address the conditions that enable this virus to spread so rapidly, particularly among underserved communities. And we've got to observe the public health measures that we know curtail the spread of the virus. Wearing a mask, social distancing, washing our hands, uh, observing the restrictions that, are, that we've been asked to observe. If we do these things, plus, and I think we'll talk about a vaccine in a moment, and therapeutics, then we're gonna get through this uh, in a way that does much less harm than if we don't do these things. Great. David, how has Stanford Medicine supported COVID-19 uh, testing in the Bay Area? And how are we continuing to enhance these efforts? Well, I have to say our team has done an incredible job. If you look at the testing that we've been able to form, perform, uh, we know that recently there has been a Board of Supervisors meeting in Santa Clara that actually has called out healthcare providers to do more testing. They would like to see more in our community in order to be able to see whether the slow of the spread is occurring. I have to tell you though, if you look at what our team has done, and we've talked about being able to be one of the first in the country to be actually be able to do the test as a provider, even being able to do the serology. In fact, our teams have now scaled up to be able to do a tremendous amount of tests, in fact, close to 20,000 on a daily basis. We do testing for individuals throughout, not only our Santa Clara community, throughout the Bay Area, and in fact, early on in this process, we're doing close to a third of all the tests in the state of California. So if you ask, what have we done? We have really been leaders in this area. And in fact, continue to do that to make sure that we are part of the solution that actually is being provided across the area and our community. Yes, and really a distinction from other areas in the country who don't have this uh, sort of response. Paul, nearly 100,000 children have tested positive for COVID-19 in the last two weeks of July. How is that shaping the response of Stanford Children's Health? And what does it mean for reopening in general? Uh, thank you, Andrea. As, as we mentioned earlier in, in, our, in our town hall meeting here, uh, we've seen the numbers increase in the community uh, across the board, but the increase that has been most alarming for us is the increase in the number of kids. Uh, early on, there was a belief, a false belief, that kids were somehow immune to this uh, virus. We've known that that's not true. Now, as we see those numbers come up, uh, we see some of those cases turning into actual hospitalizations. As I mentioned before, our, our average census, as David mentioned, early in the pandemic was zero to two patients a day that had COVID. Now we're averaging more uh, in the nine to 12 range. Uh, we are confident that we have the expertise, we have the staff, we have the PPE, and we have all of the necessary facilities uh, to care for an increasing number of patients. Uh, but the best thing we can do is what we know that works. Wash your hands, wear a mask, socially distant. Great, thank you. And now the question uh, I've been waiting for, uh, will we have, Lloyd, will we have a COVID-19 vaccine by January 1st, 2021? And how is Stanford Medicine leading uh, vaccine and therapeutic development? Well, I don't know about others, but my crystal ball is a little cloudy these days. Uh, I'm optimistic. We had the privilege of interviewing Dr. Fauci a few weeks ago. He's optimistic that there will be a vaccine or vaccines by the end of this year, early part of 2021. The clinical trials are progressing. We're gonna do a lot here to understand the immune response to, vaccine, to the vaccine. And we're already doing a lot to understand the immune response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, what makes me and others encouraged about vaccine development is that there is a robust immune response to this infection. And that is essential in order to develop vaccine because what a vaccine has to do is to elicit that immune response without making someone infected. There's a lot of work going on through our Human Immune Monitoring Corps. That has been an area of emphasis at Stanford for over a decade. And we're ideally positioned to do the detail and are doing the detailed studies that will really define the immune response both to the virus and ultimately to the vaccine and enable us to 
use a precision health approach to vaccine selection. It's very likely that one vaccine is not gonna be the best for every person. And to determine which vaccine or which approach is best in individuals will be determined by work being done in the Human Immune Monitoring Corps, among other places here at Stanford and around the country. Okay, great. To Paul and then David, will hospitals operate differently after COVID-19? And if so, how? And how can we try to prepare for that future? Uh, the short answer is yes, uh, we will be operating differently. Uh, through this pandemic, there are a couple of things we actually wanna hang on to. Uh, you heard earlier in terms of how we stood up from less than 5% of our outpatient visits being uh, virtual to at its peak, almost 80%. As that number has come back down closer to 40%, uh, that's a reality that we wanna sort of hang on to. The other thing that we've been able to do during these past four or five months is we've demonstrated that we can do the impossible if forced to. Uh, but the trick is, how do you take the force to to want to? And so as we think through how do we make improvements in the way we deliver care in a way that's smart, I think we've demonstrated that, that that's absolutely possible. And it's possible because of what we said at the top of the hour, because of the people that we have, because they are indeed our greatest asset. David. To some extent, I'd say ditto to what Paul said, a great uh, answer. I hope that we hold on to some of the things that we're actually learning. We have been able to, through, in fact, this employee forum that we're on today, if not triple, in some cases, 10 times the attendance of what we were getting when we did these live. And so the ability to distribute information, get engagement has been so much higher through that use of technology, not only with our patients, but just internally. In fact, even our monthly managers meeting, which we're lucky to get three to 400, we've gotten close to a thousand. So I love the fact that actually people can engage in technology differently. Lloyd was mentioning travel earlier. I think we've all appreciated not having to travel as much and a lot of the meetings now can actually be more inclusive that we can interact with some of our peers across the country through technology. And there's a lot of aspects to the care that we provide that will be benefited by that greater engagement in some of the things that we do. We know that our life will change to some extent, not as much as other industries that in fact are almost entirely moving to work at home. But we do see some of those advantages even within our own teams that will allow us to have to travel less. And we hope not always fight the traffic that's here in the Bay Area and hopefully that will stay down a little bit even as we look at that into the future. So we know that there's changes coming, but I do think there's some positive things that will actually come out of this. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much to the three of you. It's been a pleasure to be here and for your updates and also your vision as we move forward here with COVID-19. Also, thank you to our viewing audience for joining us here today. We will have another Stanford Med Live in approximately two weeks with a topic forthcoming. Uh, we're grateful to all of the Stanford Medicine community for your engagement and what you do every single day. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.